Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Zane Asher is the author of Where the Children Take Us, How One Family Achieved the Unimaginable. Zane Ejiofor Asher was born to first-generation Nigerian parents in South London. A graduate of Oxford University and Columbia University, she is currently an anchor for CNN International. She anchors One World with Zane Asher, her own global news program on the network. IGFOR Asher's brothers are Oscar-nominated actor Chiwetel Ejiofor, who was in 12 Years a Slave, successful entrepreneur Abinze, and medical doctor Kendibe. She lives in the New York area with her husband and two sons. And Zayn is doing the launch event with me for bookends, along with Jenny Molin and Alyssa Shalaski, and I am so excited about that. Welcome, Zayn. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss where the children take us, how one family achieved the unimaginable. Thank you so much, Zibi. I'm I'm still smiling ear to ear because before we started recording this, Zane had been talking to me about about bookends and has been like the nicest person ever. So I'm like literally just like glowing as I talk to her about her book. I, I, I loved it, Zibby, honestly. It was it was absolutely I couldn't put it down. Thank you. Okay, where the children take us. Speaking of couldn't put it down, I posted that I read this all on a plane and I was like, you know, frantically reading. I fell in love with you and your family, all the things that you've been through, the way that you write. Like, I am so rooting for you, for everyone. I was like, wait, I want to hear more now. Like, where is the PS about this brother? And like, what is her little sister doing? And like, I I need to hear more. I want to like, anyway, you did a fabulous, amazing job of taking us through your life and your parents' lives and the history and so much. Why don't you, I guess... Explain what your book's about, why you decided to to write and share all this about your family and your life, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Oh my God, Sibi, thank you so much. So the book was a difficult one to write because it starts off, as you know, with basically the worst day in, in my family's life, collective life. My mother is at home in London and she gets a phone call. And the voice on the other end of the line basically says to her, your husband and your son have been involved in a car crash. One of them is dead and we don't know which one. It is earth shattering. I mean, she to this day will describe that phone call as an emotional earthquake. I mean, there's no there's no other way to basically put it. So my dad and my brother were on a road trip in Nigeria, which is where we're originally from. They were traveling from this sort of small town called Enugu going on the road to Lagos, which is like the New York of Nigeria. And it's supposed to be a six hour drive. And somewhere along the freeway, the person driving them swerved into the opposite lane to cut traffic. And as the car went around a bend, it hit a blind spot and it was crushed by a speeding tractor trailer. And everybody in the car was killed instantly, apart from one person in the back seat where my dad and my brother were sitting. And so initially the relatives in our family, extended relatives who were all sort of living in Nigeria, were told that both of them had died in the car accident. Then hours later, some other relatives heard word that no, 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 maybe one of them survived. Maybe the little boy might've survived. And hours later, another group of relatives had actually heard that both of them were killed. There was so much confusion on the scene of the accident. And, you know, so there was just a lot of debate happening. And then somebody, while the sort of debate was going on, somebody actually called my mother to tell them without having all the facts. So it turned out it was my dad who died in that car accident. My mother traveled to Nigeria and on the plane had no idea, no idea who she was going to be 
burying and, them. And she was pregnant, by the way. She was pregnant. She had three kids and she was pregnant. No idea who she was going to be burying, you know, that week, whether it was going to be her husband or her son. And it was pure agony, pure agony, the weight, the weight, you know? And so, yeah, as I mentioned, she gets to Nigeria. She goes to the hospital where the, the hospital was attached to a morgue. So she was told where to go. And her relatives, our relatives, were planning on meeting her there to sort of, you know, break the news when they eventually found out gently. But um, she got there before them and she found out that it was my dad who died and it was her son, my brother, who had been spared. And so the book really is a celebration of my mother's strength because one of the questions I've always been asked my whole life is how on earth did your mother do it? How on earth did this woman who was an African widow, immigrant, obviously, growing up or living in South London in a neighborhood that was kind of rough, beset by poverty and crime. How on earth did she manage to raise you, a CNN anchor, your brother, an Oscar-nominated actor? My brother was nominated for starring in 12 Years a Slave. He's an actor. My sister, a doctor, and my eldest brother, a very successful entrepreneur. How on earth could this woman have, have done that? And so the book is a celebration of my mother. It's my way of saying thank you to her. And it's my way of really explaining in detail how she did it, you know, which I think is a very, ultimately, even though it starts off with this difficult sort of heartbreaking tragedy that happened to us, it's ultimately a story of hope. Wow. Yes. All of that. Amazing. It is a story of hope. She is the most remarkable woman and she is still alive, right? I mean, yes. I feel like I want to give her a huge hug and be like, hats off to you from all the moms out there. I mean, not it's not even it's not even just that you all went on to have successful careers, although that is remarkable in and of itself. It's that like it's the type of people. Like, look at how great a person you are. I know we were talking about this earlier, but the heart and humanity and the work ethic and all of the things that you all have sort of overcome and achieved and the way in which you did it and the family commitment and and all of it. It's just, it's remarkable. I do appreciate, by the way, I mean, <laughs> this reminds me of like the Tiger Mom book from a while ago, you know, like Confessions of yes. Tiger Mom, right? In that like there are all these different parenting styles and just from the parenting style, tragedy heartache, everything else, even even just to put all that aside for two seconds and just talk about her parenting techniques. When she got rid of the TV and like broke the cord and installed a payphone in your house. I mean, yeah, these nuts, are, uh, this is no joke. Wait, talk a little <laughs> bit about, and this is, she was determined to get you into Oxford. And by the way, there was one line, I'm sorry, I'm like all over the place because I'm so excited about all the stuff in this book. Let me see if I can find the passage, but there's one passage where every time she was concerned about behavior or anything, there was no punishment. She just like drove you back to Oxford to see what you could have. It well, was so, I, right? Yes. So I would, I would say that, you know, just to sort of backtrack a little bit, it yeah. was very, very hard for us after we got home to London after my dad's funeral. Yes. It was, my mom would sort of- And I should say, I am so sorry. I, I shouldn't have jumped right into that. I'm no, no. The, the tragedy that happened and all of the details surrounding it and the aftermath and all of it was so heartbreaking to read. So heartbreaking. And it was so visual. I feel like I was in that room. I feel like I could see your little brother in the bed, who, by the way, I did not realize was going to become the actor winning, the actor nominated. I didn't realize that whole thing at all until like you reveal it in the book. Um, anyway, I'm very sorry for all that you've been through and your mom's been through and your whole family. So. Oh my gosh, Sidi, thank you for the kind words. So yeah, it was really difficult after we got back from London because what basically happened is that my mom was unable to parent. She was in such shock and she was in, as I mentioned, just such a state of deep, deep emotional agony and pain and trauma yeah. that she would essentially lock herself in her bedroom for hours at a time. And just all we would hear is that little kids were was screaming and crying and Ugh. screaming and crying on the other side of the door. And so we didn't really have a mother or a father for quite a while is what it felt like. And my eldest brother, who was 14 when my dad passed away, you know, that's a really difficult age anyway for a boy because you're transitioning from boyhood to manhood. That is the time when you need a father figure. He got kicked out of school and he used to be a sort of straight A student. He got kicked out of school, started hanging out with the wrong crowds, sort of, you know, was sort of consumed by the streets, you know, and that was a bit of a wake up call for my mom because after that, she sort of realized, my gosh, I need to get my family back on track. I mean, you know, as an immigrant coming from Africa, the only reason why you move to, or the main reason I should say, why you move to the United States or to the UK is 
so that your kids can have a better education, you know, to give your kids a better life. And so to not just have her husband pass away in this horrific way, but to have her oldest son, who is a very, very bright young boy, get kicked out of school. That was a big wake up call for my mom. And so my mother began, and this is, you know, the sort of meat of the book. She began to sort of implement very sort of clear structure and routine to keep us focused on schoolwork, to keep us focused on anything besides the empty chair at the dinner table and to keep my eldest brother away from the streets. And one of the things, the first thing that she did was a family book club. Oh, that's right. I meant to, I meant to talk about that first. I love the family book club. That was a genius idea. (laughs) The family book club, I was only five years old at the time. So it was really designed for my oldest brothers and she would basically give them texts or books to read, usually the classics. So we're thinking, you know, Mark Twain, Rudyard Kipling, and they would have to sort of discuss it at the dinner table every Friday night. When I got a little bit older, she asked my teacher for my school syllabus for the year. And she would look down my school syllabus. This is when I was like sort of seven, eight years old. And she would figure out what I was going to be learning in school in maybe a month or two months. And she would teach it to me ahead of time beforehand. So that by the time I learned it in school. By the time the teachers taught it in school, I'd already mastered it and I already knew it inside out. And of course- And she was coming home from her job 14 hours a day on her feet at the pharmacy that she owned and come home and do this with you for three hours at night. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. And it changed my life because even at the age of seven, I could see, I could understand for the first time that what you put into something is what you get out of it. And by knowing everything that the teachers were teaching already, because my mother sort of secretly taught me ahead of time, it meant that the teachers started treating me a lot differently. They, I became this role model for my entire class. I became, you know, we weren't graded at age seven, but it would be the equivalent of basically a straight A student. And, you know, anytime there were sort of awards to give out to the kids or whatever, my name would always come up as number one. And it sort of fueled my desire to go home and do that again, and learn in advance again with my mom. And one of the other things she did was what sort of she refers to, we refer to as the eight hour rule as we were coming up, which was, you know, she would make us divide our day into three equal parts. Um, So obviously there's 24 hours in a day. And so she would make us divide it into three parts of eight hours each. And she would say, right, eight hours to be spent sleeping, eight hours to be spent in school. And the last eight hours of your day should be spent working towards your dreams because Her whole philosophy was that, listen, everybody generally sleeps for eight hours. Everybody generally, you know, either is in school or at work for eight hours. Obviously, if they're lucky enough to just have one job. So the only thing that can ever set you apart in life, the only thing that can ever distinguish you, distinguish you from the next person is how you spend the last eight hours of your day. And that, again, sort of translated through high school for me. You know, it really changed our work ethic. And, you know, my mother, who was solely motivated in the early days by, you know, just keeping my oldest brother out of trouble, ended up with all of these sort of parenting, amazing sort of parenting, you know, philosophies that really changed our family's life and allowed us to live up to our highest potential. And um, then we can get to the Oxford stuff. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, it, it was just, it's really just a continuation of that. It's how she modeled success and made everything attainable. She's not like, try this and maybe you'll achieve this. She was like, you're going to do this. Like, I'm going to show you how. Like she gave you the whole roadmap and never really wavered. Even when there were setbacks, even with like the the school where the horrible girl like planted the, oh my gosh, that was terrible. Talk about that for a second. That was like horrific. And that she pulled you out of the school and she, you know, you just move on to the next and then, you know, yeah. it's not going to derail you. Yeah. I mean, so my mom grew up in Nigeria, right? So in Nigeria, everyone is black. So skin color is not a thing. Nobody talks about race. Nobody talks about skin color. It's just not even brought up. So when it, when she came to England and she moved to England in the 1970s, it was really difficult for her to experience racism. And England in the 1970s was sort of like, you know, there were sort of posters put up saying, keep, keep England white, you know? And so for somebody who had never understood the concept of like race and skin color, that was really difficult um, because she'd grown up surrounded by Black in a country where everyone was black, everybody was generally, you know, African, and uh, race was just not something that anyone cared about, talked about, whatever. So when we sort of grew up, you know, each of us, my siblings and I, did experience racism at different times, and it was very hard for her to 
navigate or understand how to sort of give us advice. She came up with a few strategies, but as you point out, there was a point where I went to a school and it was a a boarding school that I went to uh, briefly. And the kids basically, oh my gosh, it's so difficult to talk about now, but one of the other girls, she had a money box that went missing. And up until this point, all the other kids were really nice to me. They were really nice. And, you know, they they knew that I was originally from Nigeria and they asked all sorts of questions about Nigeria. I was kind of like, as one of the few black girls, I was kind of like a curiosity. Mm-hmm. But when the money box went missing, things started to change for me very, very quickly. And we had this sort of one afternoon whereby the nuns at the school would take each child up to their dorm room to check their drawers for this missing money box while a nun looked on. So the nun, you would watch while the nuns sort of looked through your drawers looking for this missing money box because their whole philosophy was that theft would not be tolerated at St. Mary's, which is perfectly understandable. So one at a time, each we were sort of doing our homework, one at a time, each student went up and they would come back down. Then another student would go up with the nuns. The, their drawers would be searched and then they would come back down to class. Eventually it was my turn. And I thought, great, you know, this is, I've done nothing wrong. And they started looking through my drawers in front of me. And I was like, blah, 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 blah. And then in the third or second drawer, they moved aside my clothes and there was the money box. And I said to the nuns, oh my gosh, you know, I was only 12 years old. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I didn't, I didn't put that there. That wasn't, they did not care. As far as they were concerned, I was a thief and I'd stolen this money box. And I explained to them that, no, you have to understand somebody must have put, somebody must have put that in my drawers. I promise you, they did not care. And from that moment onwards, I was completely shunned in this school. And um, my mother was called, you know, it was a whole thing. And I was so isolated, so alone, you know, my days would be spent because having, having, not having friends in school is one thing, but not having friends in a school where everybody sort of stays the night is like kind of like, it's really excruciating. And so eventually, you know, after seeing me sort of get shunned and ignored, the person who actually planted that money box on me had actually confessed to an older student who forced her to talk to the nuns about it. And so the nuns eventually sort of, they didn't really apologize to me, but they told me, listen, we now know that it wasn't you because the girl who planted on you did come forward. And, but it was too late. My mother already took me out of that school by that point. And so I only had, I was only there for literally one, uh, I think Americans call it one semester, but it's like, it's like a term. We call it an English term. It's like just really like three months, but it was one of the worst. It was the first time I really understood like race and you know, I lost my innocence a bit at that point. But, um, you know, one of the things that my mother did, because the book sort of centers around lessons, you know, parent lessons. And one of the things that she did when it came to sort of dealing with race and some of the issues, because she had no idea, you know, how to navigate that stuff, as I mentioned. But one of the things she did was she would find when we lost our confidence and we, we felt that sort of, you know, and every sort of every sort of minority that's growing up in a society where they're different has all sorts, there's all sorts of insecurities that come with that. Um, There's all sorts of feelings of inferiority, inferiority that come with that. And so what she did was she would find newspaper clippings of black success stories and she would cut them out. It was any sort of, anytime she saw an article about a black person or especially if they were West African who had done something extraordinary with their lives, she would cut out the newspaper clippings and she would plaster them to our walls. So we would come home and we would be bombarded with image after image of Black people, people who looked like us, who were just like us, especially if they were immigrants, who had done something extraordinary with their lives and who had overcome something and soared. And this was such an important lesson because there's that saying that the only thing that can hold a person back in life is the perception they have of themselves. And my mother literally changed the perception we had of ourselves through doing that. She also had like this binder of like black success stories that she would look through. And I sort of think that th- this is one of my favorite lessons because regardless of what race you are, it doesn't matter whether you're black, white, whether you're Asian, whether it doesn't matter. Every child has a tape that plays in their mind about what they can and can't achieve in life. Every child has that. And as a parent, it's sometimes very difficult to figure out what your child's tape is saying, because it's not as if their thoughts are printed on their forehead. You have no idea. Fortunately, as minorities, my mom kind of sort of knew what the tape was saying, you know? Mm -hmm. And so her process was to undo that tape, to sort of 
get me to play a different tape in my head. And, you know, just seeing all these people, all these, I call them in the book, uplifters. In my language, it translates as Ndi Ejiamatu, which means those who set the standard. That was what my mother was looking for in these articles. And, you know, it changed, it changed my belief in myself. It made me think, wow, yes, I'm a minority. Yes, I might be, you know, one of the only Black girls in some of these situations, but I'm, I can still... I can still make it. I can still work hard. My mother convinced me that the people in these articles were just like us. And if we worked the way they worked, as hard as they did, we could have what they had. And I remember specifically one afternoon, I came home from school and my bedroom mirror was missing. And my mother had replaced my bedroom mirror with articles of like uh, Black success stories. And I asked her where it was. And her words were simply, she responded, less focus on how you look, more focus on what you can become. And, you know, that was, uh, yeah, that was just, that was huge for me, you know, so. Amazing. She was, she's just amazing. It's, (laughs) it's, no, it's motivating and empowering and all the things. You know, I know they do this. I had a a tour at one point of like a school for dyslexia and all the, that my stepmother is involved in. But anyway, like, all throughout the halls are pictures of people who are dyslexic and all of the amazing things that they have achieved. Really, it's, it's the same kind of. It's you, you can you can take whatever it is you're trying to overcome or that you feel like may hinder you, not for any fault of your own, but because of society. Like you can take anything and just you know, as long as you have the the goals, as long as you can see it, right? It's just amazing, you know. Yeah. The human brain. In order to overcome a belief, the human brain needs evidence. You know, the Mm. brain is an evidence-seeking, you know, organ or whatever. Yes. And so if you want to change a belief about yourself, it's not enough just to wake up and just sort of change a belief. You have to see evidence. That is the way the brain works. Yep. So regardless of what it is, as you point out, whether it's dyslexia, whatever it is, whether it's a belief that, you know, based on, you know, how you look or what race you are, you're not going to be able to achieve certain things, whatever. Once the brain sees evidence that that is not the case, that's how the brain begins to undo those beliefs. I don't know how on earth my mother knew that, <laughs> like intuitively, but, you know, it, it you know, just, ugh, anyway, I'm just going to cry thinking about my mother because she's just such a, she's just, just all the things that she did, you know, and some of them, some of them were quite extreme. You know, you, you brought up the Oxford thing. <laughs> which is kind of nuts. So basically my mom, you know, like a lot of immigrants believed that getting her children or her children going to, you know, a university like Oxford or Cambridge or the American equivalent, Harvard, Yale, Princeton or whatever would be the ticket to a better life. That is what, as an immigrant, I think a lot of immigrants, you know, have similar beliefs. And in England, it is a classist society system that is very much based on class. And that sometimes means that it's quite difficult when you're born into a certain situation to be able to move up. Mm -hmm. Very rigid in that sense. And so there are only a handful of things that can help you move up in terms of your socioeconomic status. And one of those things is going to a very, very, very good school, if you are an immigrant especially. So my mother truly believed that as a minority, me getting into those schools would change my life. And I, and I, I think, I think she was on something. I think she was right. (laughs) (laughs) I I really do. So basically, you know, when I was 13, my mom would put me in the car and she would take me on these trips to visit Oxford. Now, as a 13 year old, I had no idea what Oxford even was. I barely could pronounce it. I had no idea why it was relevant, why anyone cared about it. But she just wanted me, even at that young age, just to sort of see and sort of, smell and experience, you know, those sort of cobbled streets, you know, the beautiful architecture. Again, and it had the similar idea to sort of, you know, plastering articles on the wall of Black success stories. But the idea was just so that I could just gradually start to believe that I could actually one day maybe see myself there. And it became a mother-daughter tradition, you know, every sort of maybe five, six months or so, We'd get in the car and we would go and visit Oxford together, like a mother-daughter tradition. But when it came time to apply to Oxford, there were a few challenges. Number one, my teachers didn't think that I had the grades to apply to a university like like Oxford. My teachers thought, listen, your daughter, that's what they said to my mom, your daughter is perfectly smart. I was sort of like an AB student, but they said, you know, she doesn't really have the sort of genius status needed to get into a place like Oxford. You know, you have to be at another level. 
And they listed up a few other universities and colleges that I should apply for. But my mom coming from Africa had never heard of any of them. (laughs) (laughs) What is is the University of Edinburgh? What are you talking about? (laughs) So she came home and she told me and she said to me, you know what, your teachers don't think you're good enough to apply to Oxford, but you know what, I'm going to figure out a plan. And she paced her bedroom thinking, you know, what can I do to guarantee that my daughter is going to go to Oxford University? How can I make that happen? And she came into my room and she was like, oh my God, I've got it. I figured out a plan. I know exactly what to do to guarantee that you are going to go to Oxford University. And I sort of rolled my eyes like, what mom? And she basically decided that she was going to ban me from watching any television whatsoever until I had an actual Oxford acceptance letter in hand. And of course I thought she was nuts you know, but she was very determined because she felt as though going back to the eight hour rule, how a person spends their spare time is critical in terms of what they end up becoming, what they end up doing with their lives. And so, you know, of course, like any, any sort of teenager, I rebelled. I didn't sort of listen, but eventually, you know, without television, I began to spend all my time on the phone. And I would call boys, I would call anyone, you know, if you can't watch TV, what else is there to do? Okay, you know, this is like the year, what is it, 2000 or 1999 or whatever. I would call boys, call all my friends on the phone. And then she decided, she'd realized that I was basically replacing one distraction for another. And she said, I'm going to come up with a plan for that too. And one day she came home, it was a Sunday, and she came home with what what you'd call a residential payphone. I don't know if they exist in America, but in England, you can get these things called residential payphones. They look like normal phones, but they have a slot on one side for coins. And you can find them in like doctor's offices. And they're not expensive. And she brought home literally a payphone. And she said to me, you can use the phone all you want, but you're going to have to pay for it yourself. And so she completely eliminated all distractions and created an environment whereby I had nothing else to do but study. And of course, I rebelled. Initially, I would do anything but study. So I'd come in from school, I'd go for a walk, I would, you know, have talk, stare out the window, talk to my sister, anything but... But eventually, I actually did begin to study and I began to sort of read around my subjects and open books and, and read and et cetera. And my grades began to improve, so much so that my French teacher stopped my mom and said to ask about, you know, my sudden surge in grades. And my mom explained it was just about eliminating distractions. And my French teacher asked my mother about what to do with her own children. (laughs) Asked my mother for advice, you know, which I find so funny. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously it worked out for me. I got into Oxford. And the fact is I didn't get in because I'm a genius. I didn't get into Oxford because I'm the smartest girl on the planet. You know, I didn't get in because I was, you know, legacy or anything like that. I got in because my mother created an environment where I literally had nothing else to do but study. That was it. And it was just for two years. And yes, it does sound extreme, but, you know, as a black girl, especially as an immigrant coming from Africa, you know, I was born in London, but my obviously my family's from Nigeria. Going to a place like Oxford, especially if you, you haven't grown up with money, it does change your life. Like it really, really, really changed my entire life. And when I got that acceptance letter, I remember crying to my mother, thanking her, because even as a sort of teenager, I was only 18. I could literally see that my mother's decision to eliminate distractions had completely changed the trajectory of my entire future. And so I I just like was like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it's such a, for me, I mean, I can't speak to anyone else, but for me, it was just such a small price to pay for, you know, living, you know, the, uh, the life that I, that I have now, which I'm, I'm very lucky to be at CNN. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And you write about that too. I feel like I could talk to you for a hundred hours. <laughs> I mean, this is like the podcast is not, not long ago. I want to go through every like part of your life that you write about and like discuss it with you and be like, wait, tell me about this. So we'll have to do this in person or something, but, but yeah, you also really track how you become a CNN anchor. And also I loved how you prepared, like you, you have this instinct now, like, you know, you need to be ready for things when they f- fall into your lap, which of course they're never doing. You're like envision, you're, you're manifesting all of this stuff and then you're ready. So I'm referring to how you prepared for like this interview that, and the, the man training you was like, you know, you're not going to be an anchor. No one's going to ask you to audition for this. And you're like, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready no matter what happens. And yeah. then of course it happens and you were ready and you knock it out of the park. And now look at you. It's amazing. It's like, it's just the most inspirational story. <laughs> yeah, no. So basically my mother's sort of teaching me to prepare 
in advance. Like when she went through my syllabus when I was seven years old and she looked at what I was going to be learning and she taught me ahead of time so that, you know, by the time I came up in school, I already knew it. That I thought was genius. And I applied that to my adult life as well. So when I got hired at CNN as a correspondent, obviously there was lots of, and I'm a preparation queen, so there's lots of, (laughs) but I decided that, you know, my mother's lessons about preparing in advance had had worked wonders for me, Um, you know, and I wondered, you know, whether or not it could even help me when it came to eventually, you know, becoming an anchor, which was a dream of mine. And so even though I'd only been at CNN for, it was less than a year, several months, but less than a year, I decided that I wanted to start preparing to anchor. And even though there were no anchor positions open, I mean, people don't, once you get an anchor position at CNN, you generally don't leave. It's such a great job. And even though no one had asked me to anchor, I decided to find the talent coach. CNN employs these talent coaches, you know, full time. And I went to one of them and I said, listen, I I would like you to train me to be an anchor. And he looked at me weirdly because he was like, you haven't been in the company that long. Has anyone asked you to anchor? I said, no. And he said, well, you know, why do you want to be trained? There aren't even anchor positions available. And I said, I just, I want to be trained just in case. So good. Just in case one day, you know, an anchor position opens up. I just want to be ready. I'm a firm believer that the, the issue isn't whether or not your opportunities come. The issue is whether you're ready when yes. your opportunity comes. That's the big Thing. So he began to train me and, you know, several times a week after work, we would sit in the studio and we would just practice and he would make me study some of the domestic anchors, some of whom, of course, household names. And, you know, I would look through the scripts and I would study how they ask questions and how to do breaking news and all of that. And then um, eventually, several months later, I found out that CNN International was looking for anchors. And I threw my hat in the ring. And even though they wanted me to sort of audition or have a screen test, you know, in in a few weeks or whatever, from the time that I found out, I, you know, they were sort of nervous because I obviously I didn't have that much time to prepare. But what they didn't know is that I'd been preparing for much of that year. And so just by being ready and having prepared all those months with that talent coach, when the opportunity arose and when there was an anchor position available at CNN International, National, I got it because I was ready. I was prepared. Zane, your the book club opened no, up. <laughs> it, it's so amazing. And we've only like scratched the surface on even more amazing, inspiring tips, tricks, stories, all the Nigerian history. I mean, <laughs> oh my God, I learned so much. Uh, like I'm embarrassed I didn't even know about. So I am such a huge fan of this book. I love that I got to know you through this book and here we are now and it's just amazing. And everybody has to read Where the Children Take Us, How One Family Achieved the Unimaginable. And I can't wait to see you in person in like two weeks. So Yes, I will see you too. Zivi, thank you so much. Thank, and, thank um, you. There was so much love- more to discuss, but okay, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Interview, loved your book too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 